On a recent trip to Australia, we discovered that it's not all about shrimp on the barbie. In fact, it may be the most exciting cuisine in the world, and that's because it's near Asian Indonesia. So all those influences have come down to a real fusion cuisine. The first thing we discovered was pulled pork, but it's made with miso and gochujang. It's absolutely incredible. The second was cauliflower roasted with a thick miso glaze. And finally, we had a very simple miso ginger dressing that goes on everything from vegetables to chicken. So stay right here at Milk Street as we explore the new Australia. Funding for this series was provided by the following. Ferguson's proud to support Milk Street and culinary crusaders everywhere. For more information on our extensive collection of kitchen products, we're on the web at fergusonshowrooms.com. For 25 years, Consumer Cellular's goal has been to provide wireless service that helps people communicate and connect. We offer a variety of no-contract plans, and our U.S.-based customer service team can help find one that fits you. To learn more, visit consumercellular.tv. Since 1899, my family has shared our passion for everything that goes into our multi 100% Italian tomatoes. Only tomatoes, only multi. Designed by cooks for cooks for over 100 years. Cookware collection by Regalware, handcrafted in Wisconsin. The AccuSharp knife and tool sharpener, designed to safely sharpen knives in seconds. AccuSharp, keep your edge. I gotta start by doing some selling here, okay? So we all love pulled pork, at least almost everybody does. And it's one of those dishes you think are iconic and you don't wanna mess with it and you just can't make any better. Now, <laughs> we were in Australia not too long ago and discovered, to our surprise, because we don't know any better, that Asian food, Indonesian food, has greatly meshed with what was Australian food. In fact, Almost everything is Asia influenced. You were there actually not too long ago too, right? I was. Yeah. And so you see wasabi and gochujang, you see miso, cilantro, mint, et cetera, et cetera. So the cooking was quite different and fabulous. We went to a place called the Bird and You, E-W-E, -E, a couple called Mills and Kim, and they do a pulled pork. The two things they add to it that make it stunningly different and wonderful are white miso here and gochujang, the South Korean hot paste. And it's not harder. I mean, it's, a, it's an incredibly simple recipe, but it completely transforms pulled pork. I think one of your kids just eats it cold <laughs> right out of, out of the tub. I mean, it is so good. So this is a story about Australia, about Asian and Indonesian influence and how to take an iconic American dish and turn into something that's, okay, I'm saying it better, it's better. You did say it, and <laughs> frankly, it is, in part because it's so much easier. Uh, for this dish, we're really counting on these high-impact flavors for big, bold flavor in a very simple method. We're gonna start with a five-pound pork butt. We're gonna break it down into roughly two-inch pieces. So I'm gonna use a, a very flexible, thin knife and just trim some of that fat cap away. So that's a fair amount of the fat. At this point, we can cut it into two-inch slabs And then we can break these down into two inch pieces. Probably say about like that. So can I ask a question? So now a lot of people when they do this are gonna look at this and go, do I need to take this out? It's a good question. For the most part, I would leave it in. Okay. Cause you can always skim the fat off at right. the end. And as we all know, fat is flavor. So at this point, I'm just gonna chunk these up. Again, it's two inch chunks. You don't have to be precise here. There's no need to break out the ruler. And it looks like a ton of pork there, but remember that's really gonna cook down as it braises and we're gonna end up with far less. And to this, we're gonna add our flavorings. Half a cup of gojujang. This is the Korean fermented chili paste. Tons of flavor, it's lightly sweetened. This stuff works miracles. Next, 
hoisin sauce. We've got a quarter cup of hoisin sauce. Hoisin's Chinese. You're usually not gonna mix something like gojujang and hoisin, but it works beautifully in this dish. And we've already decided that, you know, in Australia, they feel pretty free, free to mix it. anything. Yeah. Hoisin adds some really nice sweetness, which intensifies the pork flavor. And one more fermented product, we're gonna add two tablespoons of white miso. So now we have Chinese, Korean, and Japanese flavorings in an American in, pork In a classic dish. American whole pork <laughs> recipe, yes. We're gonna add the stems off of a bunch of cilantro, about three ounces of ginger, and we peel it so you don't get any of the bitterness from the skin, and then one cup of water. It doesn't seem like that much, but remember that pork's gonna break down, it's gonna sort of stew in its own juices. So let's bring this up to a simmer. It's a lot of hard work here, right? We dump everything in the pot, bring it to simmer. That's why I said it's an easy recipe. Yeah. It is. Those really strong, bold flavors allow us to get really amazingly flavored pork here with very little work. Now it's time to cover it, would you please? And we're gonna transfer it to 325 degree oven and cook it on the lower middle rack until it's easily pierced with a knife, about three hours. So while the pork's braising, we're gonna make this amazing onion miso mixture to add to the pork, which is gonna help sort of cut the richness and balance it out with this great bittersweet profile. It's really good. Let's bring this pan. Medium high heat, two tablespoons of oil. Wanna wait for that to start shimmering. So we're gonna add two large onions, thinly sliced. Half a teaspoon of salt. And we're gonna mix that up a little. The salt draws out the moisture from the onions and helps them cook faster. It also sort of collapses them down. We want a really nice jammy texture to these onions. And we're gonna cook them until they're really brown because we want that really bittersweet profile. It takes about 15 minutes. You can see how the onions have broken down. There's a little bit of char on them. It's all gonna counter that richness of the pork. Here comes the secret ingredient, miso. So we're gonna add four tablespoons of miso paste. Again, it's the white miso. We put two tablespoons in the pork itself. We're gonna add more here to layer that flavor. So quick question, a white miso goes better with pork than a red miso, which would be better with like beef or? Not necessarily, I, just for this dish, uh, it works better. Red miso can be really strong, uh, it's very salty, it's more robust, it can be a little bitter on its own. Okay. So we wanna cook it until it darkens a good bit, about four or five minutes. So I do have a question when you're in Australia, was this merger of Asia, Indonesia, Australia, is this something that's been going on a really long time or is this something that's more in the last 10 years? Australian cooking is very open. Uh, they're not hidebound by rules and there's a lot of flexibility there. The meat pies, that's right. a very Australian thing. And there was um, all sorts of Thai flavored meat pies and hmm. uh, it was really exciting. You can see that the miso's darkened up a good bit and you can smell it too. It's lost that sort of just sweet flavor mm -hmm. and there's some bitter tones coming through. We're gonna pull it so it doesn't cook anymore, otherwise it could get really bitter. So let me put it on this plate here. Spread it out. So we can refrigerate this till the pork is done. Chris, it's been three hours. I checked the meat when it was in the oven, easily pierced with a paring knife. And now let's go ahead and finish the dish. Mm -hmm. Look at that. That looks really good. Well, I mean, you can look at it, but that's better. Yeah, the aroma is amazing. The ginger comes through really clearly. So we're just gonna use tongs to lift out the meat. You wanna make sure to grab those chunks of ginger. Those would be a surprise, wouldn't they? They would be a surprise. It's one right there too. Oh, thank you. So at this point, let's go ahead and skim that fat off. Just use a, a big serving spoon and really just skim the surface. Now this might be a time to use a fat strainer though, right? If you have one, it's a great time to do that. So Chris, that looks pretty good. We got the bulk of the fat off. So now we're gonna reduce that liquid down. So bring it up to medium high and we're gonna cook it till the sauce is really thickened enough that you can see a streak when you swipe a spoon through it. Should take about four or five minutes. You can watch that. In the meantime, let me shred the pork. This is why Matt and I get along so well. I, I watch the pot and he shreds the pork. This is great. I'm just like, it's perfect. You could make me a cocktail. But... This, is, this is a real relationship, I can understand. <laughs> Chris, that looks perfect. Now let's go ahead and finish this off. We're gonna add four tablespoons of fresh gojujang at this point. It refreshes the flavor, adds a little heat. 
I'll use a whisk to really incorporate that. You know what's gonna happen in a couple of years? Maybe it's already happened. Gochujang Chang is gonna be the new Sriracha. It's gonna completely take over. A couple of years, I think it's too much. Because it's got that sweetness to it. You know? It does. And now we're gonna add the meat back in and the onions. Give that a stir. It's amazing how much that pork is cooked down. Remember when it was raw, it was almost to the top? Looks a lot better than when it did raw though, I'd <laughs> say. <laughs> I might agree. So we wanna warm everything back up over medium heat for about five, 10 minutes. Okay. It's bubbling away, it's clearly warmed through. One final touch. We're gonna add three tablespoons of unseasoned rice wine vinegar. Helps really cut the richness, brings out all those flavors. Along with the pork recipe, we picked up a couple great garnishes from the Bird and You, including this Gojujang spiked sour cream. Super good, might replace mayonnaise in my house. Is that high enough for you? No. Keep going? Well, yeah. And these really gingery shredded carrot pickles, which and, are fantastic. And pickled jalapenos and some cilantro. Absolutely. Okay. It's almost like a Vietnamese sandwich. You get the pickles, the cilantro, the jalapenos. Mm. That is fantastic. Yeah. And about the messiest sandwich I've ever had. It's so much better than just plain pulled pork, which is also great, but. This yeah. is remarkable complexity to this. You have all those fermented flavors, add layer after layer after layer of flavor. Mm. The two things I love about this, you're taking a standard classic American dish, which is great, but you're making it more complex, right? It has a it's sweet, savory, has depth, has the miso gochujang. The other thing is it's not any harder because you're basically throwing everything in a pot and putting it in the oven for three hours. Do some onions in between, freshen it up at the end with a little bit of vinegar and gochujang, but it's not more work. So it's more complexity, it's more interesting, but it's not more work, which is perfect. It's why we're here at Mill Street. Easy, but actually more interesting. So miso gochujang pulled pork is pulled pork with miso and gochujang. <laughs> it's, that, it's that simple. You just throw it in the pot and walk away and come back. It is absolutely terrific. Thank you, Matt. Oh, you're welcome. You know, one of the many surprises we had in Australia was that miso is a core ingredient in lots of recipes. Now, miso, you can think of almost as MSG. It's one of those basic foundation flavorings. We don't use it much here in America, but we can, and it's a way of improving your cooking really quickly. So what is miso? Well, it's fermented soybeans, usually with a grain, like rice. So a white uh, miso has rice and soybeans that are fermented. Uh, it's sweet, it's not too salty, it's sort of our all-purpose miso. Uh, yellow miso is fermented a bit longer, so it has a little bit more flavor. And then a red miso is fermented with barley, uh, and so it has a much richer, deeper flavor, probably better for meats than anything else. So we're gonna start with white miso here. There's a lot of things you can do with it. A couple ideas before we get to our dressing. You can mix it with butter, 50-50, one part miso, one part softened butter. You get this wonderful umami flavor. It's great to put over grilled meats, for example. Or you can make a stock, instead of buying lousy chicken stock at the supermarket, you can use half a cup of miso, four cups of water. Uh, you could saute some garlic and ginger, add the miso, then add the water. It takes about five minutes to make, has a lot of flavor. So now we're gonna make a miso ginger dressing. This is a great all-purpose dressing. It's good for salads, it's good for vegetables, even chicken salad. So how do you do it? Well, we start with a third of a cup of walnuts and a third of a cup of white miso, that's the mildest form, that's what we usually use, a teaspoon of lemon zest, and a quarter cup of lemon juice, also a quarter cup of water, that helps loosen up the miso. We have an ounce of peeled sliced fresh ginger, goes in. Um, we have a teaspoon of honey, and we also have a teaspoon of Dijon mustard, And finally, a half teaspoon of white pepper. And we'll put that in a blender in uh, about a minute or so. By the way, the walnuts are not toasted. We like sort of the creaminess of the uh, raw nuts. It's pretty good. 
Uh, and finally, we have half a cup of neutral oil. Uh, grapeseed oil is used a lot. Uh, it doesn't have that fishy flavor canola has, so we like that. And we'll put this back in the blender for about 30 seconds to emulsify. So now we have a really nice, creamy, and a bright dressing with lots of ginger, lemon in it. Uh, it's really nice, goes with almost anything. So you can use it over salad if you like. Um, I'm only going to use a little bit of it. Like that. So a couple rules about dressing a salad. Use a big bowl. Um, only put a small amount of dressing on it first and then toss for 15 or 20 seconds with tongs. The more you toss, the better coated everything gets. You end up using less dressing than you think you need. So that's our very simple miso ginger dressing. Miso is a great ingredient to use in your kitchen when you want a lot of flavor fast. So being in the food world over many years, decades, <laughs> Foods come in and out of fashion, right? And so kale, blah, blah. Well, it's cauliflower now. Every time we do a recipe for cauliflower, it's like goes to the top of the list. So we were in Sydney about a year ago uh, on the waterfront at a restaurant called Fujisaki, Japanese restaurant, of course. And they served a cauliflower dengaku, which means glazing with sort of a miso glaze. Uh, and we'd never seen that done to cauliflower before. So we thought we'd bring that concept back to Milk Street and do a roasted cauliflower with a miso glaze. Yeah, this is, I do have to admit, this is one of my favorite recipes. That See? I, I, yeah, from Milk Street. You, really... you got the cauliflower bug now? Yeah, okay. I do. It's, it's amazing, and it's really, really simple. So the first thing we're going to start with, we're going to prep our cauliflower. I'm going to start with uh, about a two-pound head of cauliflower, and I'm just going to peel off these leaves, the greens, as much as I can. All right, I'm set these aside. And we want to cut these into florets that are about an inch and a half to two inches. They're fairly big because we're going to be roasting these in a really hot oven. Um, and I'm going to start by cutting this actually from the bottom down because I do that. I want to preserve all the little florets. I don't want them to crumble into little pieces. So I'm going to start by cutting in half. And then I'm going to cut each one into a quarter. And you don't even need to necessarily cut all the way through. You can break apart the rest. And I'm going to take each quarter and turn it on its side and then just cut away the core. And then with each quarter, then you can just gently break through the bottom stem there mm -hmm. and break them apart. Mm. Transfer them to the bowl. You have a gentle touch. Well, yeah. <laughs> I, there's a couple crumbles, but it's pretty, it's not bad. You know, I like the tip of not cutting all the way through, because yeah, when you cut all the way through, you get these flat slabs, right. not the florets. Yeah. Right. And again, because we're roasting these in a hot oven, we really want them to be an even size, you know, larger pieces. Now, we're just going to toss these florets in three tablespoons of peanut oil. And we're going to add a quarter teaspoon. We have white pepper here. We felt that really tracked well with the other flavors in the recipe. There's a nice floral notes. And I'm just going to toss these to coat. Okay, so these are nicely coated with the oil. And so now I know I mentioned that I was going to be roasting these, but we actually have our baking sheets been preheating in a 500 degree oven with the rack set in the lowest position. And I'm going to go get that. We're going to work real quick because we want to retain the heat of that baking sheet. Okay. Thank you. Just going to make sure we get all the oil out of the bowl. And I'm just going to distribute these in an even layer. And you want to make sure that they're actually on their cut sides, not on the florette sides, because that'll get better browning. You want to move pretty quickly, because you want to keep the heat of that baking sheet. You can hear it sizzling. Yeah, it's already started. The browning and the caramelization's already started, which is great. OK, so this is going to go back into that oven. And it's going to roast for between 15 to 18 minutes. You want it to be just tender and uh, a little bit spotty brown on the top. Okay. 
Okay, Chris, well, that's roasting in the oven. We're gonna go ahead and start our glaze. And again, this is really, really simple. We're gonna start with a third a cup. This is red miso. We preferred this for this recipe. It has a slightly heartier, a little bit more savory flavor. You can also use white miso. Um, this can be a little harder to find. To this, we're gonna add four teaspoons of rice vinegar. You wanna make sure this is unseasoned. Rice vinegar. We're gonna add two teaspoons of sake. Teaspoon of honey. Gonna have to use your finger. I'm gonna have to use my finger. Yeah. Hands are the best tools sometimes, right? And then we're gonna add also a teaspoon. This is finely grated fresh ginger. That's gonna give it a little heat as well. And then now we're adding two tablespoons of water and this is just to get the right consistency, to loosen it up a little bit. And we're just gonna whisk this all together. The vinegar is gonna add a nice kick and it's gonna help offset all the other sweeter ingredients that we have. Miso has a little natural sweetness to it. We have the honey and the sake. I'm just gonna whisk it till it's smooth. And that's basically it. We just have to wait for the cauliflower. So you, you're in charge of simple recipes this year. Exactly. <laughs> Few ingredients, 10 minutes, we're done. That's it. Okay, Chris, this looks great. I roasted it till it's just tender, and you can see it's got that really nice spotty brown coloring on the edges of the florets, which is gonna add a really nice flavor. So now we're gonna add this to our bowl that we have our glaze already made. So it's, it's glazed post-roasting. Exactly, exactly. If we tried to roast it with miso, it can burn quite easily. Right. So this way we get the nice roasted flavor on the cauliflower, but the miso retains its nice bright, fresh flavor. And you can see the edges of the cauliflower really beautifully golden brown because we had that nice hot sheet pan. So I'm just gonna gently toss this to coat it. And you do wanna be fairly gentle because you know it's cooked now, so it's a little bit softer. I also love the color of the red miso. Okay, this looks good. And now we're just gonna add our last few garnishes here. We're gonna be adding a quarter cup. These are pistachios that have been toasted and chopped. That adds a nice crunch. This is a bunch of scallions that we've thinly sliced. And it's okay to add, we're adding both the, the white parts and the darker green parts because the heat of the cauliflower is gonna slightly mute that you know, raw onion taste. And this is a quarter cup of chopped fresh cilantro. This adds a nice bright green color to this and the fresh herb flavor. You know, I grew up eating boiled cauliflower. Oof. So I, I think that's maybe why people like cauliflower now, because it was They've never so, had it. <laughs> it was prepared so miserably yeah. for like the last 150 years in America. Finally, someone figured out that uh, you could put something spicy or interesting on mm -hmm. it. I think you might be right. And that's it. You just want to- Boy, that looks good. Yeah, toss it till it's just combined. And we're ready to eat. Thank you. You're welcome. So see if this is an improvement over 1950s cauliflower. Yeah, I, I hope so. I think it will be. Oh. Mm. That is fabulous. Yeah. It's got a nice, bright, sweet tart flavor. I really love. You know, the two ways of thinking about growing up in the 50s and 60s, one is the food was so bad that now I'm older, I've gone from terrible to great food. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's the top of the bell curve. Things are looking good. The other is that I grew up with terrible food, you know? <laughs> I mean, if, you, if you're a kid now, you have, you know, pretty good food. It's true. Mm. So this roasted cauliflower with miso glaze comes from an old Japanese concept, dengaku, which is glazing with a miso, sort of sweet miso glaze. We found this recipe or similar one at Fujisaki, a restaurant in Sydney, uh, and we brought it back here. And it has great flavor and it's really easy to do and it transforms cauliflower. You can get this recipe, all the recipes from this season of Milk Street at MilkStreetTV.com. Funding for this series was provided by the following. Ferguson's proud to support Milk Street and culinary crusaders everywhere. For more information on our extensive collection of kitchen products, we're on the web at fergusonshowrooms.com. For 25 years, Consumer Cellular has been offering no contract wireless plans designed to help people do more of what they like. Our US-based customer service team can help find a plan that fits you. 
To learn more, visit ConsumerCellular.tv. Since 1899, my family has shared our passion for everything that goes into our Mutti 100% Italian tomatoes. Only tomatoes. Only Mutti. Designed by cooks for cooks for over 100 years. Cookware collection by Regalware. Handcrafted in Wisconsin. The AccuSharp Knife and Tool Sharpener. Designed to safely sharpen knives in seconds. AccuSharp. Keep your edge.